we'll go ahead and uh, jump into this here and start going into some of the uh, the, the bits and bytes, uh, if you will, of uh, this particular campaign and what it was that we saw. So as you can see in this first slide, uh, where we have the, uh, the, the diagram of our attack overview, there's a lot going on, right? Um, we have the beginning of the malicious email all the way to the impact and the deployment of the Black Bastard ransomware. In between, you have a lot of moving pieces, a lot of different steps. Um, we're going to break this up into pieces, but uh, you know, just to be clear, I'm not going to go through every single bit of what we, of everything that we observed. Uh, we do have a full threat analysis report that will be released both on the Nest and in the Cyber Reason blog in the coming days. Uh, for all of the details there, I would highly recommend going through that uh, that write-up. The analysts that worked on that, they did an excellent job, a lot of really, really great information in there. Uh, in this presentation, we're going to point out uh, some of the more interesting pieces that, uh, that we observed in this, and it kind of make this campaign a little bit different from some of the other typical uh, Quackbot or Qbot campaigns that we've seen before. And uh, kind of just showing how this is advancing and maybe pointing out the, uh, the team up between Qbot and Black Bassa and how that's, you know, how those two groups are working together here. So a few pieces to point out here is that this is very much human operated. This campaign is very much human operated. Um, I've talked to a number of customers where they they seem to have it uh, have the understanding that some of these campaigns are fully automated, uh, that it's a piece of single piece of malware and it just moves autonomously on itself. So while that is highly possible, and we have seen uh, you know campaigns in the past that have been completely automated, where it's just from deployment to ransomware, it goes completely on its own. In this particular case, this was very much human operated. Um, but there were subtle differences. We saw a number of uh, these particular incidents uh, in various customers, uh, most of them all in the uh, in North America, but different verticals, different parts of the country, you know, et cetera there. And while the broad strokes were the same, for going from incident to incident, there were subtle differences in each one. And I want to kind of point that out here because it's very important to think about the overall behavior of what's going on in a particular campaign instead of paying attention to those brittle indicators that uh, that happened, you know, with some other, you know, some other vendors or some other campaigns that you may think of. So the broad strokes that were the same here, we have phishing at the start. We have QBot being used for initial entry. Uh, code injection was happening in warmanager.exe and getmac.exe, which we'll talk about in more detail here in a second. Credential theft, because they needed that to be able to move laterally in the environment and to accomplish their goals. And then, of course, finally, ransomware deployment. Those subtle differences that we saw were in the initial entry, you have either a BBS script or you had a link file or a shortcut file. Uh, that was used for the initial QBot infection. We're going to look at a link file here in a minute uh, just to show you some bits and pieces of you know, how this looks. Uh, and then we have uh, a number of C-sharp tools that were loaded into memory and that were used for various functions, uh, mainly for credential development. But we noticed going from incident to incident, sometimes you had different uh, tools that were being used there. Excuse me just a moment here. But, uh, yeah, sometimes you had different uh, C-sharp tools that were being used from incident to incident for credential dumping, depending on whatever the, uh, the operator was comfortable with. Now, again, you know, going back to the broad stroke statement, what was in common is that you definitely had a goal in place. And where they could standardize, they did. And this standardization allowed for very quick movement in the attack. Like Israel mentioned a couple of slides ago, uh, we went from initial infection to ransomware deployment in 12 hours. So uh, definitely moving very, very quickly. And the way that that happened is through this standardization where they had um, very specific goals that they had to accomplish uh, to make sure that they were well established and then began moving deeper into the network to make sure they had plenty of back doors to get in. Uh, and then they went straight after the domain controller, tried to disable those security products, and then deployed their ransom. So looking at the, uh, the malicious email and the initial infection, um, the phishing emails themselves, they were delivered through a pretty well-known tactic uh, that's called thread hijacking. So this 
the way that this works is that it could be somebody that was already compromised that maybe you do business with, or, uh, you know, it could be a fake email, something they found on the internet, anything along those lines. But they construct their phishing email to make it look like, you know, this is an already existing conversation that you've had with the person on the other side. So then when they send you a link that says, hey, download this or, you know, open this file or I'm going to send you a password protected zip and here's the password, um, it sends a trigger in the user's mind of, okay, well, it's probably not completely unusual that they're going to be sending me this. Um, I've I've done business with them before. And so then they have more of a, a higher likelihood of downloading the zip file, running things, clicking things, and letting bad stuff happen. Uh, the, the way that they got in, they used a number of simple but pretty thought out obfuscation techniques. And this is where I want to actually start sharing my screen and show what this looks like. Give me just a moment here. Start the screen share. All right. So using this uh, this particular sample here, uh, this is a similar sample as to uh, what attacked one of our uh, one of our customers, and it starts out with the delivery of an image file or an ISO file. All right. When when you double click on these. It automatically mounts itself just as a drive. You know, so you're going to see this as like a DVD drive in this particular host. And then you have, from the uh, victim's perspective, just the one file is contractcopy.js. You have hidden files of this data.txt and then this hidden file directory here. So if we go into this contract copy here and take a look at this, it's actually pretty simple code. This here is just a signature, you know, just another way of being able to get around uh, very basic um, security, you know, uh, you know, security tools. And then we have this variable that's been established here, this Q. And what we're doing is we're reading in this data.txt file. Well, data.txt file is this right here. So if we open this up in Notepad, we get just this SVR32. Okay, no big deal. It seems, uh, you know, it seems pretty, pretty safe. Uh, and then if we look at this other line where we're calling the shell dot application, so that's going to be calling cmd.exe, and we're executing this particular command where we have reg, and then we're calling our Q variable here. So what we're doing is we're reading in data.tech, and this is going to be the SVR32. And we are concatenating that, or we're combining that with reg here at the beginning, which turns this into reg serve 32. And then we're calling this, you know, this particular directory here, and this soloist.test, this particular temp file. So if we go back to our image file, we have our hidden directory. If we go in here, and there's our temp directory. Now, inside of this hidden file, we have a number of other things that are put in there that are actually pretty interesting, and they're, they're just junk files, right? Uh, and they're in there to make this look bigger or to throw off uh, what's called entropy or to throw off, you know, some of the brittle signatures that are looking for, you know, small files or only, you know, the, the LNK file and then a DLL or something along those lines. So to throw that off, we have a couple of empty directories in here, just empty folders, nothing there. Uh, a couple of just random computer-generated image files. Again, nothing at all malicious here. And then what I thought was the, uh, the most interesting is we have a text file. Nothing malicious in here whatsoever. It's actually several sections of Alice in Wonderland. It's just been put in here just because. <laughs> uh, so again, just uh, very simple ways of being to being able to obfuscate uh, their initial entry, uh, and then the execution of this soloist attempt. That's your Qbot loader. Now, uh, going back to the presentation here. Uh, let's see here. All right, so we should be back on the other uh, slides. So moving on, uh, other parts of obfuscation or other ways that they try to hide here 
is we see a lot of examples of hiding in plain sight, as I like to call this. And this is not a new concept, you know, uh, low bins or living off the land binary. These are things that have been done, you know, for a very long time. But, you know, definitely wanted to throw out some interesting, you know, concepts or some interesting things to think about and how, what the behavior was here. So we have wormanager.exe, all right, where code was being injected into this. So wormanager.exe, this is part of the Windows area reporting. So when on, you know, in Windows, when you see that little box that pops up that says, hey, we ran into a problem, we're sending some information back to Microsoft, and then we're going to close the program, that's wormanager.exe working in the background, right? Uh, so it's completely normal. Uh, it's there as part of the operating system. It's signed by Microsoft. Uh, it should be completely legit, except when it's not, right? Uh, and in our case here, we see code being injected into it. That is, that's QBot that's injecting into it. So in our slide example, we see wormanager.exe, and then we have the various child processes that are almost like fruit of the poison tree, if you will, uh, to where we can see very unusual behavior. Uh, we have getmac.exe next here, and getmac.exe, it's just like it, you know, I mean, it does what it says in the name. It's used to retrieve the MAC addresses of the installed network cards in your computer. So it's there for, like, your Wi-Fi card, your Ethernet card, uh, your Bluetooth, you know, uh, card, you know, et cetera. Uh, but in this case, there was code injected into it that loaded various C Sharp tools and was mostly used for credential dumping. Now, again, very not normal behavior of getmac.exe. Uh, but you have to be looking at the loaded modules to see this and to be paying attention to the behavior to see this. Otherwise, you're just going to see a Microsoft signed executable doing something. Uh, back in uh, late October, the QBot gang, who they're not really known for changing their stripes very often, but here recently they've been changing the name of their, their main module, their main uh, QBot loader. And at the end of October, they changed it to this uh, FW policy IO manager .dll. Uh, This is the, uh, the QBot loader uh, that's being loaded in memory and executing from there. Uh, we see this inside of warmanager.exe. Now, again, this module completely normal inside of the Microsoft uh, operating system, inside of Windows, okay? Uh, the difference, though, is that in this, you're not going to see an image file on disk. You're just going to see this as a module loaded in memory inside of warmanager.exe. Uh, then you'll also be looking at the other, you know, subsequent child processes. So these two things together, and this with no image on file, this is a dead giveaway of being QBot. Now, uh, once they had established themselves, uh, you know, onto the, uh, you know, onto the host, dumped all the credentials that they need, and they were in a position to be able to move laterally, they did so, and of course, using everybody's favorite tool, Cobalt Strike. And this is another example of, you know, some very standardized processes. Uh, remote service execution was how they decided to move laterally, uh, you know, to other hosts that they had access to. And in every instance, we saw them drop into the public directory, which they would have totally had access to. They didn't have to worry about permissions or anything along those lines, which is why they did it. It was safe. And we saw, or we observed in every one of these that, you know, we had this COB underscore and then a number for the, uh, the module that was ran. Um, these are, you know, we saw this as either a COB 54, COB 11, COB insert number here. And it was pretty, pretty telling that this was, you know, a playbook that they were running, and it was, okay, use this particular Cobalt Strike payload that, uh, that they already had ready to go. Uh, 